I want to thank everyone for joining us today from wherever you are in the United States. I know it's kind of a crazy time. You all of us have been working from home. All of us have been kind of confused as to what has been going on the past few months. Uh, COVID certainly has affected not only our social lives, but our work lives. And a lot of us now are looking for new endeavors. We're trying to learn about new topics, new ideas, and really how to get our hands dirty within new industries. So today, I want to introduce to you my show and where we're going to be talking about the largest wealth transfer in history and how you can get ahead of it. A lot of us are going to be around the ages of 20 to 30 years old and really looking to make way into the real world. But where do we start? So when we're talking about the beginning of the greatest wealth transfer in history, we're talking nearly $30 trillion. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with trillion with a T. So I wanna tell you guys, how exactly can you get ahead of this curve? How can you learn to invest your money? How can you learn to better position yourself within the business world and make that old money into new money? A little bit of background on myself. I have been a entrepreneur for probably a better part of five to six years. I actually got my first start while I was in high school. I uh, started up a company that was focused on uh, connecting various socioeconomic groups, utilizing the platform of fitness. After that, got into Boston College where I was studying finance uh, with a minor in microfinance as well as entrepreneurship. And from there, I really started to realize that I didn't want to stick to the traditional finance path, right? And if you guys who know me, you've probably heard the whole entire story that myself and a lot of friends go through, and that is, I want to be an investment banker. I want to work in private equity. I wanted to do that until I realized that it wasn't very much going to last into the future because technology is really is just displacing our current industries, and it is going to take over investment banking as well. So as a result of that, I kind of started hearing about this thing called blockchain, started hearing a little bit about Bitcoin before I fully dabbled into it by taking the internship over the summer at a company called Liquidity Digital. Long story short, an internship later, I started heading up our business development and strategy side of things and am now full time at Liquidity going uh, full head, head, full head steam uh, into this industry and just trying to uh, position myself. Today, I actually do have a very, very special guest. And as we talk about blockchain and Bitcoin, who better to talk about that subject than someone that's been in the industry for nearly five years and has experience investing overall for over a better part of a decade. And that is Fazan Khan, the managing director at Visory Capital. Thank you, Ayan. Yeah, great to, uh, great to, great to be here. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. So yeah, Ayan mentioned I've been in Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain specifically for, for five years. Um, prior to that, uh, I was angel investing, trading stocks, um, you know, was, was into the chip stocks early. I, I just fell in love with technology stocks. Prior to that, the reason I got into technology, um, I actually moved to the Bay Area. So I'm from New York originally, moved to the Bay Area for about five years. I uh, worked for a startup called Pentaho, uh, built a sales team out. I was first really early hire, um, built the biz dev team out. Um, just saw that, you know, we raised money. I saw the whole process go on of scaling a startup and they ended up getting bought, uh, long story short, by Hitachi for uh, $500 million. So I saw revenue just probably 20x revenue my time there and I just saw it all build out and I fell in love with startups from there. Uh, came back to New York, uh, ran a consultancy practice up in the Northeast, also in the data technology space. And in that time, that's when I really started to invest. So just kind of fast forwarding a little closer to now, um, again, got into stocks, got into trading. Um, and then I heard about Bitcoin uh, in parallel. And I was also working for another startup on the side that did um, that did AI for hedge funds as well. So that helped me kind of dive into that. And that's, that's actually where I learned about Bitcoin originally, um, it really just, it, 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 and we'll talk about this, you know, it really fit my philosophy of a lot of things. You know, I was falling, I was falling in love with markets and, and learning all about economics and how the world works and just kind of piece this big puzzle together. And the way I, I, I viewed markets of uh, being, you know, more free and having some level of sovereignty and, you know, not having too much, and we'll get to this, too much, you know, uh, government involvement and all this oversight and kind of having its own, its own, you know, life force. Uh, Bitcoin and, and, and the blockchain technology more broadly, uh, I think, enables that in a big way. Um, and so, yeah, long story short, uh, after 
uh, getting into stocks and, and, and Bitcoin. Uh, I, I was still working for this consultancy, but uh, ended up doing very, very well. Um, for those of you who might not know, in 2016, kind of 2017, really, uh, we had a major rally uh, back then in, in, in crypto. I was positioned very well. I'm um, very fortunate. Um, I did well enough where I could essentially leave my, my other job and just do investing full time. And so I knew I had always wanted to be an investor. I was working towards that. And I just, this space really accelerated. And we'll talk about this. It really accelerated uh, my, my timeline by probably five years more or more, you know? So this technology um, is very unique in that regard, just the way that cycles, you know, cycle hype cycles occur. Um, and then, yeah, just, uh, uh, you know, now I'm running a fund, Visory Capital, uh, launched in 2018. And we're focused on, you know, primarily kind of we, we got in through the, the front door in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and some other cryptos. Uh, but now we're, we're also branching out and just, you know, investing actually in some startups within the blockchain space and then also other startups, you know, broadly in fintech, but definitely some some parallels into, into this space as well. So, yeah, here we are two years later. Um, you can check out our site, visory.capital for some of our investments. But I know today we're... Uh, we're really here to talk about Bitcoin and kind of the the kind of the uh, story behind the uh, emergence of it. So, yeah, absolutely, Fazan. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I want to get right into Bitcoin and this holiday high that we're on. Everybody's yeah. talking about it. I'm sure that some of you guys who are at home, no no pun intended, who are quarantined and you live underneath a rock and you haven't heard of Bitcoin, well, this is your chance to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, I kind of want to go a little bit further back than just the beginning of this year, the recent bull market that we're in. Uh, not even two years ago when Bitcoin had its uh, for largest uh, all-time high, but instead I kind of want to take it back even further towards when how the idea of Bitcoin started. And it even started before the 2008 financial crisis, which Fazan can further elaborate on, but how in 2008 people wanted, for the first time they saw the issues of government a uh, central force that was controlling the money supply, as well as the issues of large institutions who were controlling the the way that banks were loaning out money, how the uh, loan process was working, where it was actually guaranteed by the government, as well as issues in regards to uh, the the bail the bail system that was put into place for these large institutions. That despite them filing for bankruptcy, we had seen the government bail them out, and us as the American people were forced to help in that process by paying via our taxes for this uh, bailout process, as well as uh, the printing of more money. So those of you who have been following the meme trade as of late, you know, we always hear about the money printer. The money printer has been working hard in the United States for over a decade. Don't, don't get confused. It hasn't been just since 2020. So Fazan, can you talk to us a little bit about Bitcoin's emergence and some of the problems that I did address within the 2008 financial crisis, but even before that. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're 12 years into the, uh, after the inception of Bitcoin, I, th I still think it's a great time to kind of reflect on its origin story. Um, there's going to be a lot of new entrants into the space and it's not too late. I will say that. Um, it's not, I, I firmly believe it's not too late. So yeah, I, I think uh, just, just rewinding even prior to the, the financial crisis, I think, you know, that, that just kind of confirmed all the, the uptight, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, um, the pent up rather the pent up kind of um, excitement and uh, uh, you know, over, over the technology, uh, developing this type of technology. Right. So, and that, that, that kind of, those kinds of initiatives had, had been going on since the nineties and, and, and basically what you had were groups of people. So, so Satoshi Nakamoto was a pseudonymous developer who created Bitcoin. You still don't know who, who he is. Um, but those ideas and, and a lot of people don't necessarily dig in. Those ideas had, had, had predated him by, by decades, right? They're just the high level ideas were always talked about. And so there was this kind of group of developers and, and kind of this uh, very niche bunch at the time. I think they're clearly um, more, more correct about a lot of things now that we've shed light. Uh, they were called cypherpunk. So they're really, it sounds kind of silly, but it was uh, you know, a group of kind of libertarian focused people who, who kind of, and a central theme we'll probably talk about is this kind of lack of trust in institutions. And so I think they, what they saw before anyone else is that as you centralize power, whether it's governments or institutions or corporations and kind of start melding those things together and you kind of create this kind of collusion envir environment, if you want to call it that, um, you get a lack of trust from the public and you don't, you, there's no transparency and that transparency gets worse and worse. There's no accountability. 
right? And then you have bad actors, you know, in, in large institutions, you're just going to have bad actors, right? So this group, you know, if you look at Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, it's a brilliant, elegant solution to these problems that people were talking about for a long time. Um, but the concepts were there in e-gold, there was e various e-cash systems and the emergence of the internet. And obviously now we're much more mature on the internet where now we have more infrastructure so we can maybe carry some of these things out. But what Satoshi Nakamoto solved was a very elegant computer science problem and economics problem. Um, we don't have to go into the tech too much today, but um, basically he allowed for that value transfer to occur securely without a central authority. That's the key. That is basically uh, uh, one group confirming your transaction. So if I send money to you, Ion, I can do it. No one can tell me that I can as long as I pay the fee. There's no central authority telling me I cannot do that. I can't, I can send it to my wallet. I can send it around the world. There's remittance payments, all sorts of use cases. We don't have to dig in too much, but that's kind of the high level. I think it was built on a foundation of mistrust. And then what you had to wrap it up on the, on the financial uh, crisis, uh, then we're now we're at 2008. I think there was a lot of pent up uh, frustration, right? At, at this. And so if you actually look at the, and we can get into it a little bit, but the first block that was mined in Bitcoin with first transactions that was confirmed is what I really mean by that. Um, had a message in it that referred to the 2008 financial crisis. And it was actually a headline from a newspaper, the Times of UK, saying bank bailouts, uh, you know, having, having to do with that crisis. So that was really a, a solidified message at that point. But again, don't get it wrong that this was a message that had predated it by decades. So it just really came to fruition um, at this time, right, at, that, at the time of the financial crisis. And it was a perfect time for the narrative to play out. Absolutely. And I, I know you said that you don't want to get into the technology too much, but I do think it is a key point that we need to hammer down, especially when you're talking about that network that yeah. is being built by Bitcoin, that trustless environment, right? To so many people that would scare them. And I oftentimes get into this conversation with my friends, right? The whole entire reason why I'm having this episode today, uh, right before the holiday season, is because I have friends, I have family and people coming to me and saying, explain to me Bitcoin. How is it possible that we have some sort of a money that's being utilized and there's no government involved? And the way I explain it to them now, Fazan, please correct me if I'm wrong and absolutely um, come up with a better example if you can. But I like to sit down with my friends and say, look, you know, today, if I wanted to go to a bank, let's say Fazan, you are the bank and I am an individual. And let's say I have two other friends. Today, if I was going to ask you for a $5,000 loan, there is no way for any of the other individuals who are customers with your bank to be able to verify if that $5,000 that you're giving to me is actually what you have as a bank, right? As an institution, you could be lending out five, $5,000 to me, but in reality, you only have $1,000 because especially during the 2008 financial crisis, that's exactly what was happening. There was large amounts of over lending that was occurring. There was, a, there was you know, people trying to pay back essentially high invest, uh, interest rates uh, to cover up for those over loans. And that's what caused for these banks to wind up uh, or the consumers to wind up, uh, uh, we'll say just canceling out the, their debts. And then from there, the banks uh, filing for bankruptcy. So today, let's say if myself and Fazan are part of the Bitcoin network and I was to transact with him. Let's say I sent him five hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Today, that that net, that transaction cannot occur until my two buddies and other people who are part of that network validate that transaction. Uh, there's a little bit of a process that goes into it, but at a high level, they'll make sure that that money is being sent directly from my wallet to uh, Fizan's wallet, and that both of us are uh, agreeing to participate in this transaction, etc. Making that you know, that whole entire transaction, very seamless and very efficient. Now, because I think that's an oversimplification and probably not the best explanation of it, but being someone that's, you know, done a fair share of transactions over the past few years, could you really break that down for us? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's good, you know, simplifying it, breaking it down. I think, you know, for the uh, people getting into it, they want to hear that version of it. Um, so I, won't, I still won't drill in too deep into it, but basically what you have on the Bitcoin network are, you know, you have miners. So you might have heard this word if you're coming into the space. Um, these are people who are basically running very complex computer problems and solving them um, on their on their uh, on their computers, uh, on their mining equipment now. 
So back in 2008, when the network launched, I could have done it on my computer. There was enough power within my computer to, to start to solve these math equations. But as time goes on, they get much more complex. So that's kind of an easy way to maybe describe it. Um, the algorithm, the way the code is written, they get more, you know, things get more complicated as more, more people essentially go, uh, start mining. So by that, I mean the, the, the uh, uh, computer problems essentially become more complex. And so what you need is more power and so you, you have now, you have special machines um, uh, called ASICs. We don't have to get into it, but um, those are now mining Bitcoin. And so that's what allows the network to operate. That's kind of the lifeblood. Um, anyone can you know, buy those miners and do it. I, right now we do have mostly groups and, and uh, uh, around the world um, and, and companies um, you know, mining those transactions and confirming those transactions. There's an economic incentive there as well. And I think it's important is that it's all very transparent. So you kind of know the supply. This is very important because as you said, with the money printer um, that has been going on even prior to COVID, which is obviously an under horrible circumstances accelerated all, um, you don't know, we don't know, uh, really, we don't have much transparency into our supply or, 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 or how much is being inflated or where that money is going. And you talk about wealth inequality. Well, that is, you know, people, always blame companies and entrepreneurs or something like that for wealth inequality. Like, oh, they made millions of dollars, therefore they, they're taking from me. That's not how it works. Entrepreneurship is a positive sum game. What's really causing the wealth inequality is actually central banks printing a lot of money and doing these kinds of quantitative easing policies uh, where essentially that money initially goes to the wealthy because they have access to, to the capital. Mm -hmm. And the money is going to institutions and hedge funds, et cetera, and companies as well. Um, and instead of going to the people who probably need it, right? And so I won't go too much into like UBI and stuff. Maybe we can talk about that because it's mm -hmm. kind of a tangent. That's why we have that. And I have mixed, mixed feelings about that. Um, with Bitcoin, you have transparency into where the money is going, how the miners act activity, um, you know, where even where the miners are located and the pools that miners are coming into. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and again, that allows people to settle the transactions without a single entity or authority telling you to do so. I mean, I've been doing wire transfers for my investments and I'm telling you, I mean, ha uh, probably one third of the time the bank is calling me again to ask me, oh, do you want to settle this? And there's, a, you know, the fees are large as well. Someone just sent billions of dollars on the Bitcoin network for a few dollars. So yeah. there's a lot of benefits for the end user. And at the end of the day, the miners, you know, the people validating the transactions are making a lot of, you know, good economic upside as well. So incentivization is aligned on the network. That's the difference between what we have in our other system, right? Absolutely. And I think there was a few things that you brought up there that I just want to uh, bring up again, just a little bit more clarity for our listeners or viewers today. Uh, first being uh, just a comment. Yes. You know, when you're talking about the issues of uh, the government printing more money and then those loans or that money going out to certain individuals being prioritized to the large institutions and those who have those resources, uh, talk to people who are small business owners like myself, who was part of a startup. Um, it's tough to see when you're, you know, someone that's trying to uh, be a next unicorn in the industry, and then all of a sudden you hear about a company like um, uh, Shake Shack getting the $10 million business loan. Why? Because they have banking priority uh, over at their banks, or they have um, those relationships because of the fact that they are a larger company and they're less of a risk for the banks to take on. So that's, of course, going to be a topic for another day. But you specifically mentioned something that's very interesting, and that is the underlying technology that makes Bitcoin so, so important, and that's blockchain technology, right? So for our listeners today, when I say blockchain, could you really explain that? Is it just, you know, a brick and a, and a rope attached to the end of it? And that's what it sounds like to me, but I know it's more than that. You kind of touched upon the block and then the validations and whatnot, but if you could give a 30-second uh, overview. Yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's just really a way to organize transactions on a network. It's so that, that's how it's structured. And so that, you know, if I'm sending you uh, a transaction, it's validated on a block where there's an input and an output for sent and spent. And then that gets validated by the miners. And then there's a new block. And so as, as these new blocks are, 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 are confirmed and validated, that's where the miners get, a, get some incentive. So more uh, Bitcoin is minted. But the beauty about Bitcoin, again, we know the supply is at 21 million yep. and we have, we know exactly when that inflation schedule, that's never been done before. I mean, no one has, this is, and this is, again, the, the, the power of the network is that it's encrypted 
And, and so that, that scarcity, and we'll get into that probably, that digital scarcity of, a, of, a, of, a, of an asset of Bitcoin is completely hard, hard encrypted into this network and what settled by insane amounts of compute power. It's just never, it's, there's nothing close to it you can even compare, really. Actually, just talking, just picking up on that last point, right? We hear now in 2020 that Bitcoin is finally getting institutional players to come in and invest. Uh, whether that is the CEOs of large corporate uh, Fortune 500 companies or hedge funds, investment banks finally taking a look and coming out and giving their price analysis for Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of them are coming out and finally saying that it is a, um, a valid alternative asset, alternative to gold as well. So there's a lot of pieces to those arguments, but I think the first one that I really want to talk about, and I think this is the most important one because a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are worried about Bitcoin how is Bitcoin so resilient? You know, we're talking about something that was in 2018, 2017, hit its all time high at about, you know, just roughly 20,000. You know, right now we're nearing that uh, value as well. And all of a sudden in 2018, you, you look one way, the next day, it's all the way back down to around 3,000, right? So how did Bitcoin come back from the dead? Yeah, it's happened a few times. I think it's 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 two things, right? It's it's a belief, um, and I'll, we can get to that. And it's also the mining uh, lifeblood kind of the network. So I think the belief is you have large holders, mid mid middle or the middle of the road holders, um, who just aren't going to sell the thing, right? There, and there's a belief structure, and this is the new way. And we can have you know the hype cycle occur where the tourists, if you will, come in, the tourists enter, and then they sell. But when you have that baseline of belief, you know, you, you kind of have this, this price floor. It, it, you know, again, I'm not saying something else couldn't happen, but that's, that's, I believe that's what's happened so far. And I, be, you know, I believe, this is why I'm in the space, that that will keep happening, where there will be hype cycles, but they're just going to be believers and people who want, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like they want, it to, they want it to be in the world. They want it to be a, a major part of how we transact and do commerce and send value and hold the value it's mm -hmm. kind of like a savings technology people call we can get into that a little bit um but yeah i think that the belief foundation creates you know some kind of base and then of course the mining you know there's whole all sorts of people who talk about how mining has a base floor of when you know miners will start to to come back in and um miners will start there's kind of a production cost that that miners will sell at and mine you know so there's just i think it's kind of simpler than that i think it's kind of the you have a base layer of belief you have a hype cycle of all these different people trying to get in when your grandmother texts you, you know, how do I get some, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that, that's the sign of uh, some correction to come. And by the way, that's true in all markets. You know, you have hype cycles and tech stocks. And I think we're probably experiencing one right now in Tesla and some of the other tech, st tech stocks where everybody's getting into it. I'm not saying the top is in yet for Tesla. Don't, don't worry. Um, but I'm saying, you know, that this happens in markets, right? I don't think it changes anything fundamental about the technology, the vision, the developers, which we haven't even talked about. They are some of the most talented developers in the world, infrastructure developers, protocol layer developers, which is deeper technology on the internet. They just understand the nuts and bolts of the internet and they understand the nuts and bolts of security and encryption and all this stuff. So that people forget that, you know, they just say, oh, it's just uh, this thing I can't touch and feel. Well, you have an entire world team global team aside from the investors we mentioned aside from the hedge funds who are just buying buying it up we have very talented developers and companies as well building on top of it so very well capitalized companies public companies um yeah so it's just it's a very strong resilient network well, I, I really want to actually build upon that last point and i think this will probably flow right into what i'm about to ask because you know you go back 10 years ago or yeah 10 years ago let's say with amazon I remember all these investment banks, you know, to JPs, the Goldman's, all of them said the same thing about the big four tech firms, uh, mainly Facebook mm -hmm. and Amazon, for example, right? Because those were the ones that really, for the first time, created platform businesses, right? On one side, you had the social media business, and the other, you had the retail marketplace. Everyone said short these companies. Why? Because they didn't take hold of any physical products. They had no physical assets. All of it was in the cloud, and what they were creating was just a marketplace to connect two sides. Um, it was a completely, if you want to call it decentralization of those marketplaces, you know, Amazon over the past 10 years has uh, displaced nearly 15,000 retailers. Facebook has displaced nearly 7,000 social media companies. 
uh, Google itself has displaced over 8,000 media and entertainment companies, right? So when you look at those companies and you talk about their growth to this day, the only mistake would have been shorting any of those companies 10 years ago, right? Betting against them, right? So when it comes down to the value of a technology, yes, it may not be a physical asset that you can hold, but understanding that Bitcoin's value is not derived from a, its purchase power, but instead it's derived from its actual network where more and more users are joining and validating information, incentivization mechanisms put into place for these miners, as well as its continual growth in terms of being appealing to new and new people, right? I like to joke about this all the time with my friends. I'm like, uh, Bitcoin right now is like Facebook when you first joined it. In 2008, 2007, 2009, before all your grandmas and uncles and all of them took over, took over and now it's, uh, it's uh, not a good place to be if you're, a, if you're a kid growing up in the uh, 2020s, right? So Bitcoin's kind of at the same phase where it's still in its infancy, right? And you, don't, you want to get ahead before it eventually becomes the boomer coin. So could you kind of talk a little bit more about how its, its growth is, is something that's so resilient and something that is actually still at its beginning stages? Yeah, yeah. No, I think, and you, you mentioned, a, you made a good point on, on the, the network is, is really measured by the adoption. You know, I, I think all, all the comparisons to Amazon and stuff are good because you can talk about that. You know, you can talk about the doubt thrown their way, right? The tech companies, um, you can talk about that. And you can also talk about the resilience of something like Amazon after the dot-com bubble. I think it crashed 95 or 98%. Mm -hmm. And then it came back. You know, at the same time, you know, yes, Bitcoin's not a company, so we can't compare it directly to stocks. Um, you know, these companies have cash flows, you know, and the Warren Buffett talks about, you know, if I can't feel the cash flow and the dividends, you know, it doesn't really exist. There's no value there, right? Uh, you know, clearly I disagree with that. I respect him greatly. I don't think he's really saying, you know, with Bitcoin, you kind of have a little bit of an idea of cash flow and valuation with the miners. It's just very new and abstract to older investors. Um, and it's, it's a hard asset to value, I understand, you know, and, but it has a long history, price history now. Uh, and you have kind of these, these, these funds who are doubting it now getting into the game because they say, wow, this thing's just coming back from the dead over and over. There's a site, I think, Bitcoin obituaries, right? And I think it's 300 times or more now probably where Bitcoin was claimed to be dead. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, with, with, with Bitcoin, uh, back to the adoption metric, I think that's really also the the lifeblood, I know I keep using that word, um, of the network as well. If you can measure things like how many people are holding it, how many wallets are being created, how many users are onboarding onto exchanges, all of that is just going up constantly, like almost constantly. Even in the bear market, you even had some of that, those metrics going up a little slower, right? In 2017, 2000, 2018, excuse me, 2019, when the price you know, cratered, you still had people building and growing and growing the network. It just didn't, you didn't have the, the tourists. So these hype cycles, what they do is they bring in this viral um, amount of people into the network. And definitely some of those people are going to leave right when the price goes down. But as long as you keep a percentage of that every time, you keep a percentage of the, of the hyped you, the people who were hyped into it. Mm -hmm. and that's, I guess that's what happened to me when I, when, I, when I learned about it. It was in a little bit of a hype cycle back in 2015. And, and, and that kept me, right? I, so I stayed, I, I, didn't, I didn't just walk away. So you're gonna have people, yeah, what's that? It builds a tolerance. It's like a, yeah. you know, if you're somebody who enjoys something a lot and you're constantly doing it, the next time you do it, you might not feel it as you know, quickly, but you, know, you slowly build that tolerance and it keeps on building upwards. Yeah, from, and then you learn more about it. That tolerance is also, you learn more each time. So we're still kind of in this education phase. Um, we're just getting into this phase of where people are getting educated about it, starting to use it, starting to learn about wallets and, you know, and again, also the you know, technology is still in slight, uh, somewhat infancy. I mean, you have things like Coinbase and exchanges that do look sleek and good now for the average user. Um, but you know, the wallets and sending it and pasting the address in, like I'll fully admit that stuff, is, but it's good. That means it's a good time to potentially get in because mm -hmm. that stuff isn't ready yet. But you, again, you have very, very smart people working on those problems to make the user experience better. And so you're going to have mobile wallets that feel like any other app, like your Venmos. I mean, they kind of already do in a way. It's just you need to learn about the economics of crypto. And again, it's an education. It's a beautiful educational pro uh, process. And then kind of that last phase is mastery, where we're not there yet. I think that's going to be in the next five to 10 years. 
um, where that mastery is going to come in and people are just going to be constantly sending, you know, this, the different types of uh, cryptocurrency and, and holding Bitcoin and knowing about it. And yeah, it's just going to become kind of part of a lot more people's lives. I won't say everybody yet. I won't be that, that arrogant about it, but uh, I'll say a lot of, a lot of people around the world. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I want, and as, as, as our time kind of dwindles down here, I kind of want to get into some yeah, of the more uh, saucy things that a lot of people are talking about. And you talked yeah. about it with the funds, the institutions that are coming in now. The number one thing that I'm hearing in regards to Bitcoin is cryptocurrency versus crypto asset, right? You yeah. have the likes of a PayPal, uh, you know, going on the news networks and they're talking about the applications of uh, it in the, being integrated into their 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 merchant and merchant businesses and being used as a mechanism for payment. And on the other hand, though, you have a lot of companies that are deciding to put their treasury into Bitcoin, right? And they're deciding that they don't want to just keep it in fiat for obvious reasons, right? We talked about the three to four percent interest rate potential interest rate goal for for over the next few years could increase up to fifteen percent. So they decided that they want their cash to be used in Bitcoin. Um, where do you see it? Uh, do you see it as an asset or do you see it as a cryptocurrency? No, yeah, I think this is really important. Yeah, this is a good, you know, if it comes up in Thanksgiving or Christmas, yeah, the, you know, everyone who approaches you on it, who doesn't know about it, will say, oh, it's not a currency. It's too volatile, all this stuff. And we'll go into this whole tirade about how it's not a currency. And I actually, well, I, pr right now in the time, I agree. It's not, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. believe it really behaves much like, I think it, I think it's a, a crypto asset. I think it's a much better term or digital asset is fine too, if you're going to explain it to someone coming in. Um, and I think it's something that is more akin to gold. Um, and, and if, you know, for those younger listeners, you know, gold has been at some point, the U S dollar was pegged to gold. Um, long story short, it got unpegged um, in, in 1971, I believe. And, uh, and, and, and there's an interesting conversations around how that impacted things, but long story short on that, um, gold has been an, a hedge now for a lot of funds and a lot of individuals as a, kind of an inflation hedge in a way, right? As a, as a hedge to the U S dollar. And, you know, in recent times, gold, you know, has performed on and off, you know, based on different, you know, macro events and things like that. Um, but I think, and, and you see now, I mean, as, just even anecdotally in the last few months here, um, gold has not been performing well and Bitcoin has. And, and so you have this almost decoupling. And so it's really to your, for your listeners, you know, it's being re referenced as a digital gold for the millennial and Gen Z generation who want to basically store their wealth in a savings technology and who want to earn yield on it in a world where your savings account earns nothing, yeah. where you're the currency on top of that is going to be debased over time. And we can argue about inflation another time, perhaps. Is it really happening or not? I think it's happening, but it's hiding in different assets. Um, and look, I think, it, you know, young people buying tech stocks is great, too. I have nothing, you know, I think that's great. That's a way to also almost kind of store your value as well and get away from the, you know, your savings accounts. And um, but yeah, that's that's what Bitcoin's for. It's a savings technology. I like the way some people describe it as that. And I think it's an, a, a hedge, a long term lifetime hedge. Doesn't mean you can't sell and buy. I mean, I prefer to hold. but doesn't mean you can't, you know, take some out. I'm not saying it's a lifetime hold for everyone. I recommend, um, but it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're trading it, it's not the the most, <laughs> it's not the most joyful experience. I'll just say that. Yeah, I mean, I understand if it goes through a cycle and you want to sell, I get it. I'll probably at some point take a little bit off the table. Probably more so the other assets, not so much Bitcoin. I'm kind of a lifer on Bitcoin because I understand the, the economics of it. Um, and I understand the network. I think the more you learn about the network, the more you realize, wow, I, I want this for my kids and my, you know, my generations. And this is how a lot of these guys are thinking now. A lot of the big investors are thinking about it. So yeah, I think the digital asset uh, description is really important. Now, there are other cryptos that act more like currencies. We don't have to dig into it now. But mm -hmm. I think right now, Bitcoin acts a lot more like an asset. Now, if the last thing I'll say is that if the price stabilizes eventually when it gets a lot more mature, when we're in that mastery phase I mentioned, there's a chance, and then there's going to be better technologies to make it a lot faster and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. There's a chance it starts to act more like a currency. I do believe that has maybe that roadmap to act more like a currency. But I think for the foreseeable future, yeah, crypto asset, digital asset, don't pretend you're going to be buying coffee with it. If you're arguing with your family about coffee, you can't buy it to get, uh, use it to buy Starbucks you're having the wrong conversation. Yeah. So I, you know, just to keep running, keep going with that train of thought. Um, I want to first harp on gold and not to say anything about those people who are gold evangelists, but 
gold itself, we don't know it's, we, we know that gold itself is limited, but we don't know how much uh, in terms of its supply. I know Bitcoin supply is fixed. Uh, in terms of how much gold is being added to the market every year, there's two to 3% more gold being mined and being added to the market. With Bitcoin, it's not as easy because with Bitcoin, as uh, the, the amount in circulation increases, the, the, the amount of time and energy that it takes to get the next Bitcoin uh, becomes that much more harder, right? So there's that mechanism that's built into the code itself. Um, but we talked about this Bitcoin being used as a currency and eventually when it becomes more stable as an asset. And that's kind of why I wanted to ask you, where do you see Bitcoin in comparison to stock markets, right? Um, I do believe that at one point, there's going to be more countries that are going to ask the question, should we take a bit of our cash reserve and put it into Bitcoin? Um, is that something that you also consider happening in the future? And more importantly, um, we see today, right, more uh, people before used to say, when you're contributing into your 401k, focus on the S&P and whatnot, and index funds and REITs, et cetera. But don't get into these high risk stocks. But nowadays, you see people actually putting money into Apple, into Microsoft, into Google as ways to you know, keep their money safe because there's potential for growth. But at the same time, they've gotten to the point where their growth isn't going to be uh, very risky. Uh, you know what you're going to get with Amazon or, I mean, with Apple and Google and Microsoft. So is, is, do you see Bitcoin kind of replacing your, your stock market allocation as well? Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily going to replace it. I think you're always going to have room for companies and growth and innovations that are going to go in the public market. So I'm, I'm certainly, again, I'm very pro stock. Um, I think Bitcoin just fundamentally a little bit of a different bet. And it's a bet where you just want to allocate maybe a percentage of your, of your net worth to whoever you are. Um, not investment advice, but certainly what I'm doing and many people I know are doing. And, and so, uh, yeah, stocks, look, I, I think at the end of the day, Apple is a, a safe bet. They're sitting on billion, hundreds of billions of dollars. They're not going anywhere. But at the same time, when you invest in Apple and you're a long-term investor, you're someone who, you know, who's, who's young maybe, who wants to be a long-term investor, um, it's a fine play, you know, it's a fine play, but you're also, you know, you're betting on the CEO, you're betting on uh, no disruption coming in, you're betting on no antitrust laws, which will break monopoly type activity. If I don't think Apple's really a monopoly, by the way, I think that word is overused, yeah. but it, it, you know, that could still happen. You, I think Google might deserve it a little more and, and they're, they're, they're probably, that probably will happen to a degree, um, but not just the antitrust. I think what you have every decade, look at IBM. IBM was the king in the 60s, 70s, 80s and the microprocessor days. And now they're a dinosaur. I mean, they're still doing some stuff. You know, still a public company. They still have a decent market cap. But look at their growth. There's nothing there. And they've been replaced. Um, and, and, and new technology companies come along. New entrepreneurs come along and disrupt it. So I think when you're, when you're looking at those companies and you're a long-term investor, it's a different bet. Whereas I think Bitcoin's betting on a much more macro. It's betting on a kind of a new world emerging that is, you know, technology based, but also has a really macro view of where things are going with governments. And you mentioned governments, uh, you know, I do think the next phase of Bitcoin, you know, th this phase is kind of the corporate and hedge fund, where they're actually buying it, like you mentioned, institutions, Fidelity, you know, all these companies that are, are opening up shop. Um, I think the next phase is you're going to see central banks around the world, you know, small ones at first, you're going to see like Estonia or something come out of nowhere and buy Bitcoin. You know, you, you, Russia talked about it. I don't know if they actually will. Um, but yeah, you're going to see smaller, you know, central banks say, well, we, we hold some gold or, or we wanted to get some gold, but we, we, what, what's that going to do for us? It hasn't been performing well. Let's try this. And they're technologically advanced. Now, Estonia, I mentioned, because they actually have pretty good tech people there as well. They're very pro-tech. So I, I, that's my little prediction. I think Estonia is going to buy Bitcoin one day. But um, yeah, th those countries will come out and then you're going to see larger central banks. And that's kind of the phase four, the last phase people talk about with, uh, with, with the big buyers coming in. And at that point, then you can start considering it maybe more of a reserve asset or reserve currency even at that point. But again, we're 10, 20 years out to that really fulfilling um, uh, happening. So yeah, I think stocks are, are still a good bet. I think it's betting on you know growth in certain sectors and, and, and certain you know, tech is clearly hot right now. No. Um, you might have a solar company or something come out one day that invents a new solar panel. You know, you might want to buy that stock. It's a good store of value. It's a good growth mechanism for your cash. You know, it's just, so I'm, I'm totally fine with it. So I think it's just a different bet. It's a different kind of digital economy in parallel to everything. And it's a bet on the world going a certain way. And we'll see if that thesis plays out. I certainly think it will.
Absolutely. And I think this last question before we ask it sure. is the question that I have to myself put out this disclaimer once again is whatever we're saying on this podcast is certainly not investment advice, right? Do your own research. Buyers beware. Always do your due diligence. Go through as many sources as you can. And if it's not your appetite, don't invest into it. But I highly recommend that you would take into account what we're about to say uh, in terms of making your decisions because this is definitely one of those asset classes that should be a part of um, any individual's investment uh, future. So what are your expectations for Bitcoin? I know we're currently riding a, a bull wave right now or bull market, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you see it in the next one to five years, right? Or even for buyers who are looking to get into it, do I, where do I start? Yeah, I think the biggest thing now is, you know, yes, it's just had a, you know, rally. Look, it's just had a major rally off of like, you know, 10,000 uh, where it was kind of stabilized. And now we're almost at 20, which is the old all time high. Look, I think if you're a long term investor, you know, it's never it's not going to be too late to get in. You're still an early adopter. You're still in that early adopter into intermediate phase. Yeah. You know, you need to zoom out. You need to think big on it. It's like it's like like you said, Facebook back when they had basically no users. It's hard to imagine that, but 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 there, I think there is a way to imagine this playing out. So uh, I think uh, next year, I, I think you know we'll certainly have twenty, thirty percent price corrections uh, throughout the next year. Where on the way up, you're going to see price go down and kind of stabilize, go back up. I believe it's going to keep going back up. It's just my take. You're going to have stimulus uh, packages around the world. You're going to have more money printing. You're going to have a lot more liquidity being uh, artificially. I hate to say plunged into the markets and and uh, you know i don't want I, by the way i don't like that like i, I that's interference in my eyes yeah. but i understand look i understand with covid some of that's necessary so that's an outlet we were doing it anyway though that's the thing but i, I digress on that but um with that happening i i just think uh, it's good for bitcoin even though it's not my ideal worldview i think bitcoin's the perfect answer to a lot of that so you're going to have a lot of sentiment move towards that. I still think tech is going to do pretty well in parallel um, and, and kind of some of these risky tech assets are going to do well over the next year. Um, and, you know, look, I, I, I'm, I, I, don't know, I don't want to really give price predictions, but I, I just uh, I think we're going to be substantially higher by by end of next year. And I think, you know, if you're a new person coming in, I think the best way to handle this is to go on a site that it lets you do weekly buys or mm -hmm. daily or whatever, you know, and you can just put a very small amount in daily or weekly and you dollar cost average and you just don't even think about it much. Um, I, I don't really think, you know, uh, unless you're really, your goal is to trade or something, I don't really think hunching over your keyboard trading all day is going to be good for 99% of people. And you're not going to time the market if you're just getting into it. But if you really believe in the vision of where, you know, what we're talking about today and what you've read, if you've read a lot about it or anything about it, you know, dollar cost averaging in, I think is a good, a good mechanism where, you know, 10 bucks a week or whatever, hundred bucks a week, whatever you can afford. Um, that's, that's, that's relatively responsible, even though I like to say I'm irresponsibly long on, you know, meaning I have an irresponsible amount of it. I just believe in it. And, yep. uh, and, and that's done, you know, wonders for, for, for the fund. Um, and my and my, myself as well, but uh, you know, people have different uh, allocations, right? Sometimes they want to; they're more into stocks, or they, you know, I'm not going to judge on, on your strategy, but um, I think it'll be substantially higher. I still think we're early, even though it feels kind of like people getting an anxious now. Did I miss it? Did I miss it? You know, just just zoom out. Yeah, that's my biggest thing. Like I said, I referred to it before. I think this growth that we're facing right now is very akin towards the S growth that a lot of these tech companies faced early 2010s, right? You constantly ask yourself, oh, am I missing out? Am I missing out? Am I missing out? But by the time, you know, 10, 15 years passed, you could have bought every single time you asked that question, but you didn't and you missed out on a little bit of growth. So definitely recommend to people, especially viewers who are listening between 20 to 30 years old, you guys have something that nobody else does really and that's going out and you're constantly partying you're going hanging out with your friends and you're spending large sums of cash when you go out why not you know one or two days take a take a little bit of a chill pill and take that exact money that you would have spent going out and put into bitcoin put into one of your uh, one of these cryptocurrencies get a feel for it i think one thing that uh, Fazan always talks about, and it's something that sticks with me, is the idea of skin in the game, right? You won't understand. You have to be a part of the the pullback when Bitcoin falls, and you have to be a part of the, the bull market as well. 
So in order for you to truly understand what this asset means, uh, be a part of the be a part of the movement, right? Be a part of HODL. So I want to thank Fizan once again for being a part of this episode and giving us some insight into Bitcoin during this holiday hype phase that we're in. So thank you, Fizan. Please, if you want to shout out your Twitter or your website where people can follow you and learn some more information about other cryptocurrencies and investing as well. Absolutely, I mean, thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, yeah, so it was uh, Visary Capital is the fund, V I S A R Y dot capital. You can see some of our uh, portfolio. You can reach out to us on there. Um, Twitter, I'm fairly active on there uh, at Fazan J M K. So F A I Z A N J M K. And yeah, I just you know post a lot about Bitcoin, some little politics. I try to stay away, but a uh, little <laughs> little bit of little bit of everything. Uh, so yeah, happy to end. My, my DMs are open. My, I'm very reachable as well. I'm pretty uh, you know, responsive. On, I always like to talk to people. So yeah. People like, subscribe, and follow us on Twitter. Also, if you have any questions or any topics you want us to discuss, please let us know. We want to help millennials and Gen Z alike and other newbies get ahead of the wealth transfer. We're trying to create the first trillionaire this world has ever seen. Thank you and have a nice day.